It is now time for the man behind it all. So I hope you guys have met Caleb Maupin. And, you know, I wouldn't blame you as an outsider for thinking that maybe his streams are like a fake personality. It's not true. This is Caleb. This is his obsession. This is what he was born for. This is what he lives for. When Caleb is not reading, he's writing. And when he's not writing, he's speaking and organizing. How do you think Caleb wrote six books, each one promoting well-researched and novel political insights, if he didn't care about this? Now, it helps that he's been in the game a long time, over a decade and a half. And basically, since he's had full agency as an adult, this has been his decision. He has always gone out of his way, above and beyond, to make a positive difference in the world. He, more than just words, but actions, from his early days in the streets, supporting strikers and victims of police brutality, to traveling the world as a journalist, an activist, to the founding of CPI, and even today as it grows larger and larger with his help and guidance. What amazes me about Caleb is that a man so wholesome can be so infamous. The lies that have been piled on top of Caleb and CPI are innumerable. How do they get away with it? Listening to five minutes of this man tells you enough to disprove all of the slander. You go from a fascist boogeyman, white supremacist, to an anti-war, anti-racist organizer who drinks a bunch of Diet Cola. I mean, how can people stake their reputation on this slander? I mean, the political establishment and its media, uh, even a lot of these so-called dissident groups, ones that I used to be a member of, stake their reputation on this slander. We're attacked top to bottom, left to right. It's like they can't stop lying about us over and over again. And doesn't it feel good to know the truth and to be free from these spheres of power that want to turn our country into cults competing each with each other, wanting to murder each other over things like gender and vaccines, while the wealth of average Americans is destroyed and all sucked to the top, and while our sons and daughters are sent off to war or whatever pointless jobs and pursuits that they want to stick us in cycles while they depopulate us and destroy us all while we're arguing about these stupid issues that the TV is constantly screaming about. CPI is a way out of this mentality. CPI is a reservoir of sanity within the desert that is American society where everybody seems to be going crazy. But remember guys, the only thing that these powers depend on is that we keep on watching their media, we keep on believing their lies, we keep on listening to their shows, and right here I am with a room full of people, and I know there's innumerable others who no longer take the BS. We are sick of the bullshit. That's why we're here. And when you stop watching MSNBC, they want you to tune into, I don't know, Democracy Now!, which is, just happens to be owned by the Ford family, where they'll give you controlled opposition. When you stop watching Fox, they want you to go on to some unhinged right-wing show that's going to blame Jews or China or blame your neighbor for things that are being done to you by your own government and your own leaders. You're our bankers, right? They don't want you to read Caleb's books. They don't want you to have the type of consciousness that we're trying to build here in CPI. And yet here we are, here we are. There was a time when I was in PSL, I was lost, right? When people are disappointed with Biden or Bernie, the most visible alternative is these groups that are pretty much just a more radical version of the same thing. They denounce Biden for not going far enough, right? These groups waste your time, get you to march in literal circles, screaming slogans over and over again, oftentimes to an audience of zero people, <laughs> right? <laughs> CPI is not that. CPI is not here to waste your time. We have a meaningful vision. We're trying to get things done. We are organized. We are dedicated. And we want to actually win. We want to win. And I want to personally thank Caleb for helping me to realize that PSL was a waste of my time and get me to move on to something better. So thank you, Caleb, thank you. Caleb is a soldier for the everyman. He is a fighter for every exploited person on earth. 
This is a man whose vision is helping to lead us to a new America that engages in peaceful development and cooperation rather than brutal imperialism. An America where the poor are made rich and a unified America where racism is truly and systemically defeated. An America that can truly transcend the darkest parts of our history and realize our true destiny. An America that we can be proud of. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Caleb Maupin. So I was trying to figure out how to start my speech for tonight, and I had in my head that a good way to start a speech was with a joke. Uh, so I was looking for a joke to tell, and uh, I found the perfect joke, so I thought. And I told it to my wife, and she said, oh, everyone knows that joke already. Caleb, it's all over Spanish TikTok. And I said, really? And she said, yes, it's all over Spanish TikTok. Everyone knows this joke. And I said, well, I can't find a better joke, so I'm just going to tell this joke anyway. So forgive me if you've already heard the joke or a version of it, but I'll tell the version of the joke that, uh, that I know, that I heard. The joke goes like this. Uh, there's a, a very, very wealthy man, and he's got like a, a palace, and outside of his palace, there's a very, very poor homeless boy. And this wealthy man is not the nicest person. And uh, every time one of his wealthy friends comes over to his mansion, he tells them, you know, that poor kid out in front of our house, he's the stupidest kid ever. Let me go show you. And he goes to the kid, and he, hand, he holds out his hand, and he says, do you want a $5 bill or four quarters? And every time, the kid takes the four quarters. And he says, look how stupid he is. I'm offering him a $5 bill or four quarters, and he takes the four quarters. And he does this over and over and over again. Over and over and over again, he does this. Day after day, year after year, until finally one of his rich friends says, I want to know what's going on with this. And so when the rich man's not around, he sneaks, sneaks around and says to the kid, he says, why do you keep taking the four quarters rather than the $5 bill? And the kid smiles at him. And he says, because the day I take the $5 bill, That'll be the last time this rich bastard gives me some money. <laughs> and that's a point about how things are not always as they appear. And it reminds me of a story that Vladimir Lenin liked to frequently refer to. And the story was that there were two people walking through the countryside. They're walking, there's fields all around them, and they, they see a hill. And up on the hill, they see a peasant man, and he's waving his arms around crazy. And he's just waving his arms around. And they think, is this man having an epileptic fit? Is he losing his mind? And they get closer, and this man is just waving his arms around crazy. And they think, what in the world is going on? But as they get up to that hill, they see that what he's doing is he's, he's sharpening a knife. He's got a knife, and he's sharpening it on a stone. And what they thought looked like crazy, erratic behavior was actually very precise and calculated and necessary. It was sharpening a knife. And Lenin would use that analogy for the Bolshevik party in the lead up to the Russian Revolution because they split and they divided and they went this way and they went that way and it looked completely erratic, but what they were doing was sharpening their knives for the fight ahead. And that's a very important story uh, in the Marxist-Leninist tradition. And I think we can say similar things about the work that we're doing here. This is a very strange time to operate in. All the old political rules don't make any sense. We heard Scott Ritter talk about how he was a Reagan Republican and he's a conservative and he's nicer to us than anyone, <laughs> anyone on the left practically. <laughs> things don't make any sense right now. We are in uncharted waters and we are pioneers. And the reason things don't make any sense is because the political situation in the United States after the Second World War was largely based on there being this strong economy. And especially since the late 70s into the 80s and the 90s, that strong economy has been eroded and eroded and eroded. And now we're in a period where there's an economic crisis. And that changes absolutely everything. The left used to operate one way, they don't. The right used to operate one way, they don't. Everyone is totally confused because all the old rules through which political discourse in the United States was crafted, no longer seemed to apply. 
We are entering a new period. We are entering a period of a capitalist crisis. And it is only with the science of Marxism that we can understand the nature of a capitalist crisis. However, there's something else happening. And that's why this picture is so important. This day, June 30th, 2019, was very important. And it was very important not just because it was the first time that a US head of state ever visited the, the DPRK, crossed the DMZ. That was certainly important. It was important for other reasons. And it's important because of why it happened. And I'm going to read to you what was said by Jim Rogers. Do folks know who Jim Rogers was? Jim Rogers is still alive. He's a legendary investor. He used to be a friend of George Soros. They had a falling out. And he's a legendary investor. He's an American citizen. He lives in Singapore. And at the time that that happened, this is what he said. Once we open the 38th parallel, this is going to be the most exciting country in the world. I would like to invest in North Korea, but I'm not allowed to because I'm an American and it's illegal. You will be a country of 80 million people on the Chinese border, which is a huge market. The transportation and railroads on the East Coast and the West Coast could open up again. You could tie in to the Trans-Siberian Railroad, and you could join your country into the Belt and Road. Take away the soldiers, let the people come and go their own selves or with their capital and expertise and anything else. Kim Jong-un is making dramatic changes. The kid has been trying to make a deal with America for three years, and Obama cut it back. The bureaucrats in Washington cut it back when he was trying to. He wanted to sign a peace treaty. Now, when you have a billionaire talking about how excited he is to be able to do business with the most communist country in the world, and the reason he gives is because he sees that it could tie in to something called the Trans-Siberian Railroad, and something else called the One Belt, One Road Initiative. That's because at the same time that our Western capitalist economy is crashing and burning, there is an alternative economy. And many of the other speakers who spoke today very articulately explained it. There is this other alternative economy that is emerging. And so I'm going to explain what needs to be explained, what used to be considered Marxism 101, about why it is that our Western capitalist economy is crashing and burning. And in order to do that, I'm going to have to do some math. And I hate math. And you know why I hate math? Because I grew up in America. I went, to I went to public school in the United States of America. And I have spoken with people who've taught math in other countries. The way we teach our kids math here is wrong. It's memorization. It's not effective. You're not training people to actually do mathematics effectively. But you need mathematics in this world. Sometimes you have to measure things that are objective rather than subjective. You have to get a clear calculation. So I am going to, at risk of embarrassing myself, because math was never my best subject, I am going to do some mathematics here on the board for you to explain the problem. If you're a factory owner. You're making a product. You are going to need the material through which that product is purchased, or is made, the, the, you know, the manufacturing materials. So that'll be A. And you're probably going to need to transport the product to where it's sold. That's B. And you're also going to have to pay your labor costs. Labor costs are represented by C. And then when consumers purchase the product, they're going to pay a final price. And that final price is D. However, there's a problem with that, which is what? which is that there's no way for the capitalist to make a profit. He can't change how much A costs. He can't change how much B costs. So the, the profit of the capitalist can only be extracted from the value put into it by the worker. And this is the basis of Marxism, the understanding of surplus value. So C, the labor value, is divided. You have C1, which is what the worker actually gets paid. And then you have C2, which is the profit that the capitalist makes. And it all adds up to D, which is the final cost of the product. Now, the way people in the United States who talk about Marxism generally talk about this is they say, well, this is unfair. They say the worker is not getting paid the full value of his labor. And that's true, and that's an important part of Marxism. But they're missing one of the most important points, which is not just that it's unfair and then people argue, well, what about the employer? He put up the money, doesn't he deserve to be? That, that's all a distraction. Because the important thing to understand is this. 
C1 is always going to be less than D. The wages paid out to the worker are never enough to buy back the product that he produces. There is always more products created than there are wages paid out to the worker. And this is the built-in problem of capitalism, the problem of overproduction. And it is always there in the capitalist economy. It never goes away. And they have invented all kinds of crazy mechanisms to try and deal with the problem of overproduction. Part of the reason that there is such financialization now is to deal with this problem. Part of the reason that the US government has purchased billions and billions of dollars worth of cheese only to bury it in a cave in Springfield, Missouri, is to deal with this problem. It is an ongoing present problem. And it's a problem acknowledged by most capitalist economists. John Maynard Keynes said the problem was underconsumption rather than overproduction, but he was pointing to the same problem. The military industrial complex in the United States is a, an, an effort to deal with this problem, to keep spending going. There's all kinds of mechanisms that they've dealt with and invented to try and resolve this problem, but they still don't resolve it. But it gets worse. It gets worse because of something else. Right? So we talked about this is the supplies A. We talked about how this is the shipping B. C is the labor cost. What is the capitalist always trying to do? He wants to maximize the amount of profit he makes. And one of the main ways they do that is with what's called labor-saving technology. Get rid of workers and replace workers with machines. So essentially, they're reducing the percentage that C is into the overall cost. As they eliminate workers from the process of production, as there's fewer and fewer workers involved, as machines take the place of workers, the role of C in production decreases. However, there's a little bit of a problem with that. As, as C goes down, C2 also goes down, right? As C decreases, C2 also decreases. And as the role of the worker in production is reduced, the rate of profit that the capitalist makes goes down. And this is called the tendency of the falling rate of profit. Only human labor creates value. And this is something that Adam Smith acknowledged. This is something some of the popes even acknowledge. Human labor creates all value. And so when you reduce the role of human labor in production, the amount of value created decreases. And the ability of the capitalist to extract surplus value also decreases. So this causes the capitalist to have to churn out even more products because he's making less and less of a profit in the overall product. He's making less and less of a percentage, so he has to churn them out. So this problem of the worker never being able to buy back what he produces and more products being created than are necessary, this problem becomes exacerbated. And this points to what is understood to be the deeply irrational nature of the capitalist system. In a rational society, self-driving cars would be a great thing because this job, this labor that human beings engage in called driving would not be necessary anymore. With artificial intelligence and sensors, we'd be able to have all the people involved in driving, Uber drivers, traffic courts, truck drivers, they would all be able to do something else. And we, labor could be expended elsewhere, we'd have a wealthier society. But under capitalism, self-driving cars would lead to riots in the streets. And this is the problem with capitalism. This is Marxism. This is what Karl Marx wrote. I'm going to read you from the Communist Manifesto. In these crises, there breaks out an epidemic that in all earlier epochs would have seemed an absurdity, the epidemic of overproduction. Society suddenly finds itself put back into a state of momentary barbarism. And why? Because there's too much civilization, too much means of subsistence, too much industry, and too much commerce. And how does the bourgeoisie get over these crises? On the one hand, by enforced destruction of the mass of productive forces, and on the other, by the conquest of new markets and by the thorough and more thorough exploitation of the old ones. That is to say, by paving the way for more extensive and more destructive crises and diminishing the means whereby the crises are prevented. Now, that particular passage is very important. When you have a crisis of overproduction, 
when the worker cannot buy back what they produce, when the role of the worker in production is being reduced, when people are hungry and starving because there's too much food, when people are homeless because there are too many houses, when people are hungry because too much food is being produced, what do you do? Well, first, you engage in destruction of the productive forces. And on top of that, you conquer new markets. And you engage in more thorough exploitation. So what, what is he talking about? The enforced destruction of productive forces. That's called degrowth. That's what that's called. And what is the conquest of new markets? That's called war. And what is more thorough exploitation of the old ones? Driving down our living standards, reducing consumption, grinding people into poverty, austerity. And that is what we are living in, in this time. We are living in a capitalist crisis. And the only way out under capitalism is to move toward fascism and war and impoverishment to save their system. This is Marxism, what I'm preaching here. What I'm explaining right here is just basic Marxism. If you go read R. Palm Dutt, you go read William Z. Foster, this was pretty basic stuff, pretty basic stuff. However, while the capitalist system doesn't offer a solution to the crisis, Marxists have a solution. And what does the Communist Manifesto say the solution is? We have seen above that the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of the ruling class and win the battle for democracy. The proletariat will use its supremacy to wrest by degree all capital from the bourgeoisie and centralize all elements of production into the hands of the state and to increase the total productive forces as rapidly as possible, meaning that the banks and the factories and the major industries and the centers of economic power become the property of the people, and we then organize them to raise everyone up out of poverty. We get rid of the irrationality of profits in command. We organize the economy so that we can all become wealthier. Frederick Engels, the proletariat seizes the public power and by means of this transforms the socialized means of production slipping from the hands of the bourgeoisie into public property. And by this act, the proletariat frees the means of production from the character of capital they have thus far borne and gives their socialized character freedom to work itself out. Socialized production upon a predetermined plan becomes henceforth possible. And that's what socialism is, socialized production upon a predetermined plan. We abolish the anarchy of production, the chaos of the market. We put human reason and rational planning in control of the centers of economic power. And, in order to, and that then results in society becoming a lot wealthier. That's, this is Marxism. It's not the Marxism you get on YouTube, but that's Marxism. And what is the ultimate goal of Marxism? The ultimate goal is to build a world with so much wealth and so much abundance that the need for a government itself can fade away. We can have prosperity, and this is how Marx describes that ultimate stage. This is from the critique of the Goethe program. He writes, right can never be higher than the economic structure of society and its cultural development conditioned thereby. In a higher phase of communist society, after the enslaving subordination of the individual to the division of labor, and therewith the antithesis between mental and physical labor has vanished, after labor has become not only a means of life, but life's prime want, after the productive forces have increased the all-around development of the individual, and all the springs of cooperative wealth flow more abundantly, only then can the narrow horizon of bourgeois right be crossed in its entirety, and society inscribe on its banners, from each according to his own ability, to each according to his needs. Meaning the goal is we want to create a world where labor becomes life's prime want, not a means of substance. Meaning people only have to work because they feel like it, because they don't want to be bored. They don't have to. We want to create a society where the springs of cooperative wealth have flowed so abundantly that people can just kind of take what they need and do what they feel like doing from each according to his own ability to each according to his needs. And the road to doing that is abolishing the chaos of the market, getting rid of a system where profits are in command and people get poorer and getting rid of all of that. Engels writes, it is the compelling force of anarchy and production of society at large that more and more completely turns the great majority into proletarians. And it is the masses of the proletarian who again will finally put an end to the anarchy of production. That is Marxism. Now, you all heard what I just said. 
And this was common sense Marxism back in the 30s, and this is common sense Marxism in Venezuela, and this is common sense Marxism in China. But if you listen to the people in the United States who currently call themselves left, they are preaching something completely different, something that is so different from what I just espoused there, I don't even need to get into detail about what it is. But we should talk about where it came from, because there's a reason that Marxists don't talk this way. There's a reason that the forces that call themselves left in the United States are putting out a very different message. And we have done a lot of groundbreaking work in CPI for talking about why that is, documenting why that is, and explaining why they put out something different. We want to raise the level of productivity as high as possible. They want to degrow and grind everyone into poverty. We want to empower the proletariat and weaken the power of the bourgeois state. They support the FBI, and they support the, uh, the tech monopolies and censoring people. They want things that are very different than what we want. Why is this? Well, when we talk about the synthetic left, we're talking about a process. There are two different types of people who become revolutionaries. Anywhere you go in the world, you're going to find what they call a revolutionary intelligentsia. You're going to find middle class people, usually students, younger folks. Some people do it their whole life. But anywhere you go in the world, socialist countries, capitalist countries, developing world, first world, you're going to find intellectuals who are mad at the world who are aware of the injustices that exist and are looking to live an important life and you know, do dramatic things and feel heroic. And that's not inherently bad. That's a good thing to want to change the world. That's a good thing to be outraged about injustice. But that section of society, that revolutionary intelligentsia, is always a small minority. It's never more than 10% of the population. Rarely is it even 5% of the population. It exists, right? We've all seen the, the Broadway musical Les Miserables. Do you hear the people sing? Those kids in the pubs talking about how they're going to storm the barricades. That always exists. Revolutions are not made by those folks. Revolutions are made by the broad masses of people. And what the broad masses of people want in a revolutionary situation is very different from the fantasies and ideals that the, that revolutionary intelligentsia wants. What the broad masses of people want is stability. When a revolutionary crisis comes, it's because capitalism and the system has made their life unlivable. And they want order to come out of the chaos. They want to be able to feed their kids. Look at the slogans. What was the slogan of the Russian Revolution? Peace, land, and bread. Not tear it down, burn it down, but it was going to end this war. We're going to feed you. We're going to redistribute the land. You look at the slogans that the Communist Party used back in the 1930s. William Z. Foster, the slogan of his 1932 campaign was the revolutionary way out of the crisis. The message was, you're hungry, you're starving, they're setting up a fascist state, and we offer the way out. And if you look at the Soviet Union, they're industrializing rapidly and raising millions of people out of poverty. We could have a Soviet America and do the same thing. That's what the Communist Party said. And in 1940, when they ran their campaign with Earl Browder for president, they made it shorter. They made it three words, the way out, the way out, because they were understanding that, yeah, they had the revolutionary intelligentsia, they had the middle class elements there, but their goal was to organize the broad masses of people who were suffering, and their goal is for stability, not chaos. And that is the understanding and the brilliance of Bolshevism was that Lenin got a group of revolutionary intellectuals to operate in a way that they could harness the energy of the broad masses of people. He got them out of isolation and into a situation where they could harness the broad energy that was there in order to take power. And you could argue that there were almost two layers of the Bolshevik party. You had the middle class intellectuals, and then you had the labor unions, and then the mass organizations of peasants, of workers. Some people argue that Stalin kind of represented the, the linchpin between the two of them. He was from Georgia, from a, a rural background. We'll talk more about him later. Uh, and he, but he was also educated. He'd been to seminary school. He was a very good writer and speaker. And so he was kind of the linchpin between the broad mass organizations. He was involved in strikes. But he was also able to communicate and, and, and compete in the, the intellectual circles. He was like the linchpin at the center of that. But after the Bolshevik Revolution, we know that you know, Lenin died. And there was a split between Stalin and Trotsky. Trotsky very much wanted to hold on to the revolutionary intelligentsia and their mindset. He put forward the theory of permanent revolution. And the theory of permanent revolution was that 
The only good the Soviet Union had was that it could eventually march communism into where it actually matters, which is the West. Uh, he basically said, the West is the best. That's what he said, and that the Soviet Union should just be kind of a, a military state, a holdout, so we can march communism to where it matters. The New York City, he said, was the foundry where the fate of mankind will be forged. And many people look at Trotsky and say, this was very much a self-hating Russian. This is a guy who spent most of his life in exile. He was in awe of, of London and Paris and the United States. And, and he didn't much care for the Russian folks. He was probably treated very badly, a victim of anti-Semitic persecution and such. And Trotsky held on to this desire for chaos and death and destruction, the theory of permanent revolution. However, if you read Stalin's writings and his critique of Trotsky, he's saying this isn't going to work. We've got to have socialism in one country. You read Stalin's critique of Trotsky on the military question. Trotsky's saying, oh, we're going to draft all the workers into the military, and their military service will be working in the factory. That's what Trotsky's saying. And Stalin says, you can't do that. You can't do that. People aren't, that's not going to work. The population is tired of this military stuff. We need to focus on raising the living standards. And if that means we have to sign a business deal with an American corporation to come and help us set up our car industry or our oil industry, we'll do it because it's about raising the people up. We came to power offering stability and development, and that's what we're going to do. And they did it. And the whole world marveled at what the Soviet Union was achieving during the five-year economic plans because they were raising people out of poverty. And the Koch brothers, their grandfather, Fred Koch, he, he was a chemist in the United States who'd invented a, a new method of turning uh, pet uh, petroleum into gasoline for your car. And he went to the Soviet Union, and he made a lot of money helping set up the Soviet oil industry. And this was a necessary thing to do. And it industrialized the Soviet Union very rapidly and enabled them to win the Second World War enabled them to invent space travel and enabled them to build some of the high, high, uh, the largest hydroelectrical power plants, the biggest steel industry in the world. That was going on. Trotskyism was the movement of those who rejected that and held on to the permanent revolution. However, there's another layer to this. 1939. The Soviet Union had gone and tried to form an anti-fascist alliance with every major capitalist country. For a while, France was willing to do it, and then France dropped out of it. The rest of the major capitalist countries wouldn't even consider it. And so as an act of desperation, seeing World War II was on the horizon, 1939, the, the Soviet Union signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. And immediately, a huge amount of condemnation was piled on the Soviet Union, because how dare they make a, make a treaty with the Nazis? It was done out of desperation. It was not an alliance. It was simply a non-aggression pact. Um, but there was a whole public relations campaign because the communists had been leaders of anti-fascist fronts. They were immediately accused of being hypocrites. Time magazine here in the United States started calling the Communist Party USA the commu-Nazis. Uh, that was the term they used for them. Uh, Earl Browder, the leader of the Communist Party, was thrown in prison. There was a whole public relations campaign against the Soviet Union and against the Communist Party for that. And in that atmosphere, there were some Trotskyites who declared that there was nothing revolutionary about the Soviet Union, that most Trotskyites said the Soviet Union was what they called a deformed workers' state or a degenerated workers' state, that they didn't like Stalin, they didn't like the Soviet government, but the economic foundations were still socialist. But in 1939, there was a clique of Trotskyites in New York City called the New York Intellectuals who cut ties with Trotsky over any defense of the Soviet Union. As far as they were concerned, the Soviet Union was absolutely no good. And Trotsky, before his death, uh, had a big fight with these folks. And James Cannon, the leader of the American Trotskyists, also had a fight with these folks. And in that fight, uh, some revealing things were said by the leaders of American Trotskyism. This is what James Cannon, the leader of American Trotskyism, wrote about the New York intellectuals. He wrote, Trotskyism became more popular in petty bourgeois intellectual and half-intellectual circles. And for a time, it even became a fashion. However, with the approach of the war, Trotskyism as a doctrine and as a movement lost its respectability. And many of the intellectuals, sniffing danger, arranged a somewhat hasty and undignified departure. He also wrote, they mistake their own emotions, their own, their own uncertainties, their fears, and their own egotistical concerns about their personal fate for the sentiments and movements of the great masses. And they measure the world's agony by their own inconsequential aches and pains. He wrote, Marxists always begin with a program. 
They rally their supporters around the program and educate them in the process of struggling for the program. But petty bourgeois politics is always a hodgepodge, and it never attains a fully developed, consistent program. And in 1939, the New York intellectuals found their way out of Trotskyism. And then something happened called World War II. And after World War II, the New York intellectuals found their way into something called the Central Intelligence Agency. And this is a well-documented fact. Uh, Irving Kristol, who was one of these New York intellectuals, became the founder of the CIA's Congress for Cultural Freedom program. And they began with CIA money and money from the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller think tanks, publishing leftist, socialist, Trotskyist magazines, putting out a new interpretation of what Marxism and socialism was all about. Of course, it was very anti-Soviet, but it went further than that. It went a lot further than that. If you read Susan Sontag, you read Hannah Arendt, you read Mary McCarthy, this writing that they were putting out was much more than just a Trotskyist deviation from what the Soviet Union was putting out. It was anti-populism. If you read what they wrote, the people are the enemy. That is the point that they are making. Fascism, in their mind, is not capitalism in decay. It's not the result of the capitalist system in crisis. Fascism, in their mind, is whenever ordinary people are getting together and demanding things and threatening the, the, the individualism and the sacredness of the great intellectuals. H Hannah Arendt's book, Eichmann in Jerusalem. I read that when I was in college. I thought it was a great book. I thought it was about, oh, we, you know, we need to be nonconformist, don't go along with the crowd. But if you really read what it's saying, the essence of what it's saying, it's saying that deep down, the broad masses of people are a bunch of bloodthirsty Nazis. It's saying that the Soviet Union is just the same as Nazi Germany, and that we need to control the working class, because if they get together and start to fight for their rights, it'll lead to some horrendous event. Equating the Soviet Union with Nazi Germany, which is now a big part of American war propaganda, and equating both the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany with popular mass movements, and people organizing and trying to advance their economic condition. That is the synthetic left. That is the essence of what they are pushing. And if you read Leo Strauss, the founder of neoconservatism, what he was advocating, you read the work of Irving Howe, who is the intellectual father of Democratic Socialists of America, who is one of these New York intellectuals, that's their message. And it comes out of the split in Trotskyism, it comes out of CIA interventions. And at first, it was a way to manipulate the revolutionary intelligentsia. At first, it was about making sure there was distance between these revolutionary intellectuals and the Soviet Union. It was about expanding the gap between the Soviet Union and the revolutionary intelligentsia. However, in the 1970s and 80s, it started turning into something more sinister. We know who George Soros was. We know who Zbigniew Brzezinski was. And the color revolutions that brought down the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc were largely carried out with this kind of politics. It was about manipulating intellectuals, tapping into the desire of really the most privileged people in these countries. These were the children of the party elite, largely. The, this, the, you know, the academics, the people at the universities, the broad masses of people in the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc voted to keep socialism. They supported the communist parties, but it was the, the university students, it was the, the filmmakers, and the, uh, those folks, their grievances, some of which were justified against the Soviet Union, were intentionally manipulated manipulated in the name of this kind of fake leftist politics. And it was enabled to create chaos and bring down the socialist countries. And you'll recall, if you read the history, that in the Prague Spring of 1968 and the events of 1989, most of the people that were manipulated into setting the stage for Wall Street to sink its fangs into these countries, they didn't think that they were marching for capitalism. They thought they were marching for socialism with a human face, democratic socialism, more freedom. They thought they were going to keep their guaranteed job, keep their guaranteed health care, but also be able to wear blue jeans and listen to Beatles music and shop at Walmart. It was a con, and it was a manipulation, and it was very effective. And it was a continuation of this manipulation of leftist politics. And now, as we enter a long-term capitalist crisis rooted in the problem of overproduction, this movement that they first developed to manipulate leftism and then utilized against the socialist countries is now being weaponized as the new form of fascism. And it's what is really the ruling ideology of the United States at this very moment. This is what we are living under. Wokeism 
Wokeism is a result of this manipulation. They have brought the color revolution machine home to the United States in an effort to try and save capitalism. That's what's happened. And, it, and to those of us who've been to the socialist countries, and those of us who know what Marxism is actually about, it is nothing but the most outrageous and infuriating thing. And that is why we are screaming about it from the heavens. You know, I went to West Virginia after Trump got elected, and I interviewed a steel worker. And he had been a lifelong Democrat, but he voted for Trump, he said, because the Democrats don't care about the working class anymore. Now they're just a bunch of socialists. It's a tragic statement. You know, and you listen to people, you know, if I thought Joe Biden was a socialist, if I thought Joe Biden was a communist, I, I would probably hate communism and socialism too. And this vile anti-working class movement that is about controlling the broad masses of people, grinding them into poverty, setting about chaos in the country so that the ultra-rich can secure their grip on society as we degrow and melt down amid a capitalist crisis, it's very frightening. And many working people want to get together and protect their communities and their families from this insanity. And those of us who understand what Marxism really is should understand we're on their side. We're not with the woke synthetic left. If you really gets down to it, what the woke stuff is, when you talk about the identity politics or the oppression theory, it's very similar to anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is an interesting thing. If you look at anti-Semitism from a Marxist perspective, the phenomenon of hating Jewish people in Europe, often what it really was was the ruling class racializing and weaponizing the resentment of the working class against the middle class, right? The, the stereotype of Jews is that they are middle class. And the working class generally does not see the bourgeoisie. Rockefeller doesn't walk through our neighborhoods. The Carnegies and the DuPont don't walk through our neighborhoods. But if you're a factory worker, the lawyer who lives down the street or the shopkeeper who owns a store in your neighborhood, you see them. And working class people and middle class people often have a different perspective on things. For example, what's one of the anti-Semitic stereotypes about Jews is that they're cheap with money. That's one of the stereotypes that's perpetuated. Well, one thing that is a difference between working class life and middle class life is that a working class person, uh, you know, they probably have less money than a middle class person, but they get a wage. They get a paycheck every two weeks. So when they have money, they can spend it. Whereas a middle class person might have more money, but it all goes back into their business. So even though they have more money, they're going to be tighter with it because they own their own business. And so a working class person might look at a middle class person and say, what a, what a cheap bastard. What a, you know, I, I get paid every two weeks. What is going on here? He's got way more than me, but he's so tight with his money. That's how the anti-Semitic stereotypes were promoted. Working class people tend to be more socially conservative. You know, middle class folks tend to be a little bit more open minded. And if one looks at, uh, you know, in, in Asia, in the Pacific Islands, the, the, the stereotypes about um, middle class uh, folks of, of ethnic Chinese heritage is very similar to the anti Semitic stereotypes that proliferated throughout Europe. And it's a similar kind of thing. It is weaponizing working class resentment against the middle class, which is easy to do because you can see the middle class and you can't see those who really have the power. And what wokeism is, is very similar. Because wokeism is telling you don't hate the ruling class, don't hate the billionaires, don't hate the monopolies, hate the person who's got it slightly better than you. Hate the person who's got 5% more than you, or 10% more than you. And not only that, it's not really offering any solutions. Wokeism isn't about offering solutions. It's just about giving you permission to be angry. Aren't you upset about it? Aren't you angry? And it's about stoking up that rage and that hate and just stoking it up and stoking it up and not offering any real solutions, just stoking up anger and resentment. And that's what wokeism is. It is an attempt to set the stage for some kind of degrowth fascism by weaponizing people's resentment against people who might have it slightly better, and taking the onus off the system itself, and also through spiraling into a cycle of rage and not bringing people together to offer real solutions. That's what the ruling class is doing. Now, that said, recognizing that wokeism is the main danger, that doesn't mean that I'm going to unite with the right on everything or anything, really. If someone comes to me and they say that, the Chinese Communist Party and Joe Biden are involved in a secret plot against our precious bodily fluids, I'm going to tell them they're wrong. 
And if someone comes to me and says, well, the solution, the solution to the crisis of mass migration is to terrorize immigrant communities with raids, I'm, I'm going to tell them they're wrong. And if somebody comes to me and says, police brutality is made up, it's a conspiracy against white cops, I'm going to tell them they're wrong. However, if someone says that socialism is just an employee stock ownership program, I'm also going to tell them that they're wrong. And if someone says that anyone who dares oppose the war drive against Russia and China should be equated with the Nazis, I'm going to tell them they're wrong. And if someone tells me that anyone who questions that five-year-olds should be put on gender hormone therapy, if someone tells me that anyone who questions that is an evil, unforgivable bigot, I'm going to tell them they're wrong. I have no loyalty to the synthetic left. I have no duty to help them protect their system and impose their degrowth on working families. I have no, no, no reason to do that. No, no reason to protect them. They don't want us, we don't want them. Out of the movement to the masses. Yeah. Hmm. Been there, done that. There's a precedent for what we're seeing now, and that's the lead up to the First World War. The angriest writing one can ever read is Vladimir Lenin's critiques of the Second International and how all the Socialist parties sold out, and in the face of World War I, they abandoned the working class and sent the working class off to die. And the Bolsheviks stood alone against World War I. Rosa Luxemburg was with them. Eugene Debs bravely went to prison. But the overwhelming majority of the Socialist movement went along with World War I. And I've quoted this to you all many times. But the reason I quote it so much is because it's the basis of what we're doing with CPI. This quote is so important. Lenin wrote, neither we nor anyone else can calculate precisely what portion of the proletariat will follow the social chauvinists and opportunists. This will be revealed only by the struggle and decided only by socialist revolution. But we know that the defenders of the fatherland in imperialist war represent only a minority. And it is therefore our duty if we remain, wish to remain socialists, to go where? Lower and deeper to the real masses. Lower and deeper to the real masses. This is the whole meaning of our purport of the struggle against opportunism. By exposing the fact that the opportunists and the social chauvinists are in reality betraying and selling out the interests of the masses, that they are defending the temporary privileges of a minority of workers, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? That they are vehicles of bourgeois ideas and influences, and they're really allies and agents of the bourgeoisie, we teach the masses to appreciate their true political interests and to fight for socialism through all the painful vicissitudes of imperialist wars and imperialist armistices. The only Marxist line in the labor movement is teaching the masses the inevitability and necessity of breaking with opportunism and to educate them for revolution by waging a relentless struggle against opportunism and to utilize the experience of war to expose, not conceal, the utter vileness of national labor politics. When a situation like this arises, it is our duty to point out who is supporting the imperialists in their drive for war and who is opposing it. That is our job, and it is to go to the masses with that understanding. Now, the front of our room here, I guess I'll pull this one up here. We have the pictures of two great revolutionaries from American history. We have John Brown, uh, the great abolitionist who read, led the raid on Harper's Ferry, was the first person executed for treason in US history for his heroic anti-slavery uprising. And we have Fred Hampton, the leader of the Black Panthers, who built a coalition and started their free breakfast program, defended People's Korea, and was murdered. But we also tonight have two pictures of two other great revolutionaries with us that I think now it's probably safe to bring up to the front of the room. So what, can, we, can we bring up these other two photos? Thank you, Noah. Thank you, Gav. I thought these might offend some of our earlier guests, but I think it's safe to have them up here now. So uh, there you go. You're looking at Country Joe and the Fish. Little known fact, there was a band that played at Woodstock called Country Joe and the Fish Band. 
And the reason they have that name, according to every source that I can check, is because their parents were members of the Communist Party USA, and they picked the name for some pretty interesting reasons. Now, this guy was Country Joe because he was from Georgia, from the countryside. He grew up in a small village. He was the son of a bootmaker. And this guy was the fish because one of his most well-known quotations is uh, he said that the masses are the water and the revolutionaries are the fish. Country Joe and the fish. And I like that because it points to the nature of who these two men were. I'm going to read you what's been written about Stalin the mass organizer, the leader of strikes, the seminary school dropout who became the man of steel, who turned Russia into an industrial superpower and defeated the Nazis, left it with space travel. This is what was written in a book about Stalin called Young Stalin that describes his life during the, the uh, pre-revolutionary period. Stalin was hostile to the bumptious intellectuals, but he was less with the educated worker revolutionaries. He played the teacher the priest, and the workers listened reverently to this young preacher. And it was no coincidence that many of the revolutionists were seminarists or workers, often pious ex-peasants. And Trotsky, agitating in another city, remembered that many of the workers thought the movement resembled the early Christians and that he, they had to then be taught they should be atheists. And a biography of Mao Zedong written by Han Su Yin called The Morning Deluge describes how before Mao became a revolutionary, before he launched his New People's Study Group, which was the society he formed that eventually merged into the Chinese Communist Party, he thought before he could even do that, he had to take a long walk through the countryside of China. It said, as he walked, Mao inquired on the conditions of crops and rain, of rent and landlords, a peasant talking to other peasants, but also a budding social scientist and researcher. Mao kept notes of what he was told, and he remembered the peasants' names, and he walked over 300 miles on the trip. So before he even started his organization, he just walked 300 miles through the countryside, talking to every person he could meet, asking them about the conditions of their life, engaging with them. And Mao also, in his little red book, he says, how should we judge whether or not a youth is a revolutionary? How can we tell? Well, there can only be one criteria, namely, whether or not he's willing to integrate himself with the broad masses of the workers and the peasants, and he does so in practice. If he's willing to do so and actually does so, he's a revolutionary. But otherwise, he's a non-revolutionary and a counter-revolutionary. Country Joe and the fish. You can put them down. No, leave them up here. Leave them up here. You can put them up. We have truth on our side. We have a very difficult task that needs to be carried out. A lot of people in this country are suffering right now, and the capitalists don't have an answer, and they're scrambling. It's like, it's like they have a box of solutions, you know, and, and, and they're pulling out different solutions. Like, what can we do, right? I remember after Obama took office, they thought, oh, we'll have the left do something. And they, they pulled, you know, they, they, they pulled out, we're going to have leftist protests, and they tried Occupy Wall Street, and that didn't work. And then, and then you know, they, they, they scrambled around, and they said, all right, we got Donald Trump, that didn't work. Oh, and they're, 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 they've got this box of, of solutions they're trying to resolve the crisis with, and none of them are working. And I've been paying a lot of attention to what's going on in Asbury, Kentucky, right now. February 4th, there was a Christian revival service that went on for days and days and days. I think it's still going on. And it's mainly 19, 20-year-olds there praying 24 hours a day at this Christian revival service that's been going on. And it got a lot of coverage in right-wing media. And honestly, I think that this, is, this was a trial balloon. The DeSantis wing of the Republican Party is trying to retake control of conservatism. They don't like Trump because they couldn't control him. And so they're planning, as the weather gets better and as the summer gets going, a lot of Christian revival services all around the country. Why? Because they can't control Trumpism. And we remember January 6th and what have they, they can't control Trumpism. But they can control these Pentecostal pastors who go to free, all expenses paid trips to Israel every year. They can control them. The neocons and the religious right have, have quite a relationship. And if they can foment a, a movement of religious revivalism, they'll say that it's not political. But it will be political. 
It'll be about trying to reset the tone of conservatism and set the stage for Ron DeSantis to come in and basically bring an anti-woke message that has no substance to it. Aren't you tired of liberalism? Shouldn't we all get back to Jesus, et cetera? That's what they're, they're probably planning to do. We'll see. I mean, they put up many trial balloons that, that don't work, but we'll see. But there's also real pain and suffering behind what these 19, 20 year olds, 22 year olds are doing when they're there praying 24 hours a day. They're there and they're crying and they're praying and they're thinking about their relatives who died from opioids and they're thinking about a life of student debt and what that's gonna mean for them. And they're thinking about how their neighborhoods are crumbling. They're thinking about their family members who've committed suicide and they're in pain and they're crying and they're suffering, and they're saying, God, do you hear me? God, do you hear me? Well, God does hear them, but CPI also hear them. So we hear you. We hear you. We hear you at the Center for Political Innovation. Some of the happiest people I've ever met in my life were communists. I got to tell you that much. I remember uh, years ago, I was selling newspapers on the street, and there was an older, older communist next to me, and he says, life doesn't get much better than this, Caleb, being a communist. This is it. This is the best. And, you know, I've told the story many times, but it bears repeating. When I was 15 years old, I went to a communist bookstore, and I lived in a really small town, but we were driving up to Cleveland. My mom and my brother had some business to take care of in Cleveland, so my mom dropped me off. The, the communist group was having a discussion about the war in Iraq, and 15-year-old me walks into the communist bookstore, and they were having a scheduled discussion, and beforehand, my mom says to me, don't leave the store. Whatever you do, don't leave the store. So I'm in this, this store, and there's like four or five people in a circle, and we had a discussion read some newspaper articles about the war in Iraq. And then the conversation was over, and you know my mom and brother weren't going to come pick me up for a few hours, and cell phones were not a thing yet. Um, and so then they turned to me, and they handed me a stack of newspapers, shoved a stack of newspapers into my hand. And I said, all right, we're going to go sell the paper. And I was like, what? I'm like, we're going to go sell, sell the paper. And I said, well, what does that mean? And they said, we're, we're going to go sell the newspaper. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> This must be a joke, right? You want me to walk up to people I do not know and try to get them to pay me actual money for a newspaper about communism. You've got to be out of your mind. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. That is, that is dangerous. That, someone's going to punch me in the face and tell me to go to hell, you commie. Oh, my God, I can't do that. I, 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 my mom told me not to leave the store. I can't do that. I can't do that. But you know what? They said, no, we do that all the time. That's what we're doing. So I went out, nervous me went out onto the street, and I could barely get the words out. I was very shy at that time in my life, believe it or not. You know, do you want, want a newspaper and some information about socialism? I was very nervous. I didn't, I didn't it was, it was not, not, a, not a fun thing to try and do at first, but I got better at it. Never forget, I've told the story before, the first newspaper I ever sold. First newspaper I ever sold, there was a couple walking by that day. I was wearing my athletic letterman's jacket because I was from a small town called Orville, Ohio, and it had a big O on the chest for Orville, which was the town I grew up in. And it was a man, a man and his girlfriend or wife or whatever, and they listened to me. I could finally manage to get the words out or whatever. And, uh, and the guy said, well, I don't agree with you, son, about communism, but I see you go to Oberlin College. That's a neat college, so I'll buy your newspaper. He saw the O, and he assumed it was for Oberlin College. That's the first communist newspaper I ever sold. <laughs> I haven't stopped. And that story is important, I believe. It's more important than when I first started telling it. I first started telling it because it was a fun anecdote. But I think about that story now, right? And in light of a lot of things that have happened, I've reflected on that story. I've realized, you know, I was 15 years old. I was underage. It was probably illegal. That was probably illegal. You know, you have an underage person go out and sell newspapers on the street. I did not get to keep the money, I'll tell you that much. And I think, you know, I could have the attitude about it. And I could say, my God, I was labor trafficked. You know, I, I, I was in a cult and they labor trafficked me and they made me sell their newspaper out on the street. They brainwashed me. I could say that, but I don't feel that way. And obviously, you know, I don't condone anything involving younger minors or anything like that. CPI has always been an 18-plus organization. That's just how you got to do things. But 
I look back on what happened. It's one of the best things that ever happened to me. I'm so thankful for that day. And I think about what my life might be like if that hadn't happened. If someone hadn't pushed me to get out of my shell and pushed me to do something I didn't believe I was capable of doing and told me that you can go do this, you can go talk to people, you can go engage in outreach, you have a contribution to make. I believe that you are capable of doing something. Thank God they did that. Thank God they did that. It was an amazing thing. It was an amazing thing and that sometimes in life you need a push. Sometimes people have to come along and get you out of your comfort zone. Sometimes they have to shake you awake. It's something that has to happen sometimes. Now, you can argue about different ways it might happen, but sometimes you have to, you have to get people out of their comfort zone to get them to do what needs to be done. Those two guys certainly knew that. I want to take time in this presentation to point out something that perhaps isn't the most scientific Marxist thing ever to say, but women are better than men, okay? And, and we don't believe in biological determinism. We don't believe in the inherent superiority of any genders and sexes. But women are better than men. Women are better organizers than men, OK? Let's be real. We men, we like to get up here and give speeches. And we're always competing with the other guys. But women know how to hold groups together. They know how to get stuff done. You know, we love our president, Elizabeth Young, who's done so much to hold this organization together this year. And. We also love Jetta, and nobody messes with Jetta. Let me just put it that way. Jetta's awesome, and she's also done so much to hold this organization together. And we're also very proud to have the top communist woman in Britain joining us today. So she'll be, we'll be hearing from her tomorrow. I'm very excited for her presentation about the fight in the global communist movement. But women are so much better than men. Um, and, and that it, men have problems. We do, OK? And especially now, it's a very hard time to be a young man. We talk about, I mean, obviously the oppression of women, you know, sexual assault and battery and all the things that women go through, I mean, doesn't compare. But this is a hard time to be a young man also. And, you know, I, I see so many young men out there. And it's like every day they feel like they're on trial, right? And they're desperate to, desperate to prove themselves because there's so much judgment poured on young men right now. Why don't, why don't you have a good paying job you know, that pays for everything? Why aren't you married? Why don't you have a house? You know, So many young men, they've been told all their lives that they have all this obligation. And then the society around them is crumbling, and they don't find a place in it. And I meet so many young men. And we are an overwhelmingly male organization. You know, We are. I mean, there's no way to deny that. Look at this room. You know, We are an overwhelmingly male organization, and I love all the men here. And I want all the men here to know that you're not on trial in CPI. No one's judging you. No one is judging you here in this organization. We're happy to have you here, and we love you. We love you, and we support you, and we want you to make the best contribution you can ever make, and we want to empower you to make that contribution. That's what we want to do. And I say that because I want you to let your guard down. I want you to just let your guard down and give yourself to this, because it's hard in a world where everyone seems to be attacking you, where no one seems to ever give you a break, where they, everyone seems to be judging you and, and rating you, I want you, I want you to take a deep breath and say, this is the group I'm in, I'm committed to it. I want you to go all in, and I want you to let your guard down, and I want you to do your best. And it's hard, it's hard to trust in these kinds of times. Social media is so good at making everyone terrified of everyone else. Everyone's afraid, everyone feels like they're being judged and put on trial every single minute. I, won't, I want CPI to be a place where people don't feel like that's the case. I want CPI to be a place where people feel like, like they are free to be who they are and they can let their guard down because it's hard. It is so hard in these times, so absolutely hard. And I'll, I'll say this, I'll say this. I know why Maduro is still in power. You know, it was this country, Maduro was the leader of Venezuela and the United States, especially right after Chavez died, they did everything to take Maduro out of power. I know why Maduro is still in power. I know why the United Socialist Party hasn't, hasn't been defeated. Because when I went to Venezuela in 2015, when the opposition in Venezuela had a sweep and, and won the elections, after that election, they took us to a commune in central Caracas. And in central Caracas, we sat down with a, a woman, a woman, 21 years old, who was wearing army pants. And I can guarantee you she knew how, she knew her way around an AK-47. I can guarantee you that. 
And she said to us, uh, she said to us, they will never come back. And she told us her life story. She'd been a homeless, homeless young woman on the streets of Caracas, didn't even speak Spanish, only spoke indigenous languages. She'd been an orphan. And there was a priest who was a socialist, a liberation theology priest who took her in. And she grew up in an orphanage run by this liberation theology priest. And Hugo Chavez was the president, and they watched him on TV, and he taught them about Marxism, and he read them what is to be done on television, and she learned about socialism and revolution, and she told me, she said, I'm a communist, but I'm also a Christian. And she said, I believe God put me on this earth to die for communism, and that is what I intend to do. They will never come back. That's what she told me. And I also know why the Islamic Republic of Iran is not going to fail, because I've been there and I, I had the opportunity of being one of the only Americans, or not one of the only, but one of the few Americans to ever be in the presence of Iran's supreme leader, which is quite an experience. It was the, you know, the supreme leader of Iran. Uh, he speaks every year on the anniversary of the death of Imam Khomeini, the founder of the Islamic Republic. And I was in this auditorium with 20,000 people, and he walks out, and you know, he can only use one of his arms because of a bombing, and he wait, puts his arm up, and that room just goes crazy. They just go crazy, crying and screaming, and you know, the, the men extend their hands, and they, they say, the blood in my vessels belongs to the supreme leader. The blood in my vessels belongs to the supreme leader. And, you know, I, when I was in downtown Tehran and going to these conferences, I was talking to people who work in media in Iran. I was talking to, to wealthier folks who support the revolution. But when I was in that auditorium, in that mausoleum of Khomeini with 20,000 other people, I was talking to the working class of Iran. I was talking to people who wouldn't have running water and electricity if it weren't for the Islamic revolution. That's who I was talking about. And there's a reason they were screaming in adoration for Khamenei, the supreme leader because he was the one who could stand for them against the rich and powerful. He was their champion to stand with the oppressed. That's what they talk about. It's part of the Shia revolutionary tradition. And that was real politics. That wasn't leftism. That wasn't LARPing. That wasn't internet debating. That was real politics, that auditorium of 20,000 people. And in that speech, I was standing there, I was wearing my, my suit, no ties, because in Iran you don't wear a tie, but I was wearing a suit, and I'm standing there with a lot of Chinese diplomats and diplomats from African countries, and we're standing there, and he's making different remarks about different things, and at the time that I was there, in Iran there was a controversy about whether or not to call America the Great Satan. And some people were saying, well, maybe we should stop calling America the Great Satan. I was standing there as the only American in an auditorium of 20,000 people where the Supreme Leader stated his position on the issue. And he said, even though we signed a nuclear deal with the United States, we do consider America to be the great Satan. But we don't consider the American people to be the great Satan. We mean the system of imperialism, the system of war and death and destruction. That's what we consider to be the great Satan. And we will never compromise on that. And though we may negotiate, we will never surrender to the great Satan. And then I was the only American in an auditorium of 20,000 people who began chanting death to America and pumping their fists like this, death to America, death to America and tears rolled down my face. And it is an experience I will never forget for the rest of my life, to stand there. And I, I said death to America, burned American flags as a leftist before. But in that moment, everything meant something different to me because I was with those people. I was with them against the US imperialists. But I also knew that so many of the American people would have something to gain from destroying not America as we know it, but the America of the bankers and the billionaires and the war hawks and the monopolists. And there's millions of Americans who would be in that room with me if they knew the truth. If they knew the truth, they'd be in that room with me. And that we have a responsibility to take this seriously. We have a responsibility to try and communicate this in a way that will win people over. We have a responsibility to not burn the American flag, but to wave the American flag. We have a responsibility to not advocate death, destruction, and chaos, but a four-point economic plan that would improve people's lives. This isn't a game. This isn't a joke. This is serious. And it is our job to do the best that we can do here in the center of the empire 
to get working people to understand who their real enemy is and why imperialism is the enemy of all humanity. That is what our responsibility is. It's not a joke. And I couldn't unsee what I saw in that room. And that was the beginning of my trip out of the Workers' World Party. The day I walked out of that room was the day I was beginning to leave the Workers' World Party because I couldn't unlearn it. And then when I went back, when I went back to the United States and went to leftist protests, something was off. I felt sick to my stomach. I was frustrated. I was like, guys, people are losing their homes and jobs in Ohio. This is, this is a, not a joke. Can we, can we mature? Can we take this seriously? It's not about doing what's trendy and hip. It's about actually trying to win. And I saw that something was off. And then Donald Trump ran for president. And I saw Donald Trump saying a lot of things that I agreed with about the wars and about the elite. And I saw a left that didn't want to didn't want to engage with these people. They're all racist. They're all, you know, and just dismissed. Basket of deplorables, like Hillary Clinton said. And I said, we got to do something about this. CPI is a result. CPI is a result of my revelations internationally and my understanding and my frustration and my desire to take this seriously. And that's why CPI is still here. And that's why I will continue to do this. I will say, I won't say who, but I got multiple messages that really all traced back to one particular leftist personality uh, who said to me, Caleb, you should stop organizing. You should stop organizing. Just be a, a social media commentator. Just... And I heard that and I said, I don't know what that means. And I said to the person, honestly, I don't know what that means. For me, being a communist is about building an organization. It is about building a group. It is about getting things done. If I was just a writer or just a speaker or just a commentator on the internet, maybe I'd comment on science fiction novels. Maybe I'd comment on basketball or football. But if I'm talking about communism, I'm doing it because I want to change the world. I'm doing it because I want to build an organization. I read the literature I read. I read communist literature, William Z. Foster, Gus Hall. It's all about building an organization. It's not about you know, getting points on social media. It's not about having the best edgy take that everyone retweets. It's about actually building an organization. That is the point. Karl Marx said that philosophers have long sought to analyze the world. The point, however, is to change it. But I also want to say this, and this is really important, especially in light of that, that message that Nick, Nick Brana got. <laughs> you know, when we talk about a peaceful transition to socialism, that's called common sense. And it's because the masses of people don't want violence. It's the capitalists that are making their communities and their neighborhoods violent and making them unstable. And it is us who's offering the way out. And it's not simply, it's not like some legal thing. It's not like a disclaimer. I get up here, oh, just so everyone knows, we advocated a, a, a peaceful transition. Now, don't tell them where the guns are. It's not like that, OK? Yeah. It's not like that at all. It's because we're, so, we're rational. It, we're rational. And we understand that serious revolutionaries have always advocated a peaceful transition to socialism. Now, violent revolutions happen. But they happen because the bourgeoisie will not allow a peaceful transition to socialism. Mao Zedong wanted to form a coalition government with Chiang Kai-shek after the Second World War, and Chiang Kai-shek wouldn't do it. And then Chiang Kai-shek started trying to forcibly disarm the Red Army. And all the areas they'd liberated from Japan, they were trying to forcibly retake them and unredistribute the land. And so Mao said, look, we've got to defend ourselves. Uh, you know, and that, that socialists, responsible revolutionaries, don't advocate what they call left adventurism or terrorism. They don't advocate Blanquism or, or any of these deviations. They put forward a program of how to improve the country. And they mobilize people around that program. And that's what we're doing. We have a four-point economic plan. We oppose the imperialists. We oppose their state. And we raise awareness. And yes, we recognize that socialism in the United States will mean a new government. That's no, I, mean, I mean, there's no way we're going to build socialism with the FBI and the CIA and the Pentagon as they work. You know, I mean, obviously, there'd have to be a new intelligence agency based on socialist principles. There'd have to be a new military based on socialist principles. That's, that's understandable. I mean, we would have to have a new state, but we would prefer, we would definitely prefer that it be a peaceful transition. And if we were to go around advocating anything other than that, um, we would be foolish to do so. Uh, but I want to also add this, which is that uh, we also understand that the capitalists are generally, generally pretty violent in response to democratic people's movements. And we also know there's nothing more American than the right to self-defense. 
And there might come a time where our Second Amendment population feels they have no choice but to defend themselves. And if they go all out with their woke fascism and they come at the American people, there's going to be a lot of American people who are going to defend themselves. And they're going to say, you shall not pass. And they are going to protect their homes and their jobs and their communities. And when that happens, it won't be us who makes it happen. It won't be us making it happen. In fact, I would encourage you to go read the history of the Bolshevik Revolution. Because before the Bolsheviks took power in October of 1917, you had the July days. And there were many cases where the Bolsheviks were trying to hold back the masses. They're saying, it's not time yet, guys. Will you stop? Will you? They were trying to hold back the masses. Why? Because of another quote from another great revolutionary, I'll read you. Mao Zedong said, the masses are the real heroes, while we ourselves are often childish and ignorant. Without this understanding, it is impossible to acquire even the most rudimentary knowledge. When we speak to the broad masses of people, we should not see them as ignorant sheep who don't understand the answer. We should understand that when the time is right, these are going to be the people who do amazing, miraculous things. We're going to look like cowards compared to what these people will do. And we're probably going to be holding them back and saying, guy, calm down. Now, don't do it that way. Be, be, you know, we're going to be holding back the masses of people in such, such a circumstance. Lenin said that revolutions are festivals of the oppressed. And they're times where the masses are capable of performing miracles. It's, there's a boulder coming. There's a boulder rolling down a mountain. And the only thing we can hope for is that as that boulder is coming down the mountain, we can nudge it in the right direction. It is a delusion to think that it's going to be our, our ideas or our activities that are going to cause the crisis that leads America to socialism. No, the crisis will come from the system. It is our intervention that will push the crisis in the right direction and intervene. And we will use our knowledge and our, our scientific understanding to try and push, push the explosion that comes in the right direction. But that's all we can do. The masses are the real heroes, and they will assert themselves. It's our job to try and guide them to do it in a way that it leads to something better. And, and that's where I disagree with so much of the left pessimism. I mean, I mean there's, there's so much writing out there that just says, oh, there's no hope. There's no hope. It's all going to fall apart. Well, uh, I'm sorry, but you know, when the Roman Empire fell, it wasn't replaced with something better than the Roman Empire. And if we just sit back and say, oh, it's all falling apart, burn it down, tear it down, we could, they could burn it down and tear it down, and we could get something a lot, a lot worse. You know, I, I'm, I don't like the way things are in the United States, but I really like water coming out of the faucet when I turn it on. I really like the light switch you know, turning on. And if you're in a society that's collapsing, that doesn't happen, okay? So as much as you have this cathartic, woke, I hate this racist America, it's like you also like the, the water turning on, right? You also like the light switch coming on, and that could not happen if we entered a collapse. So maybe we shouldn't be telling working people that's what we want. Instead, we should be putting forward real solutions. It seems like common sense, doesn't it? So much of what we say, right? The left has lost their minds in so many, so many ways. But we have something very, very special to offer. Um, I want to say this, you know, January 6th, right, we now know what happened uh, and how there was FBI manipulation. And obviously, we don't condone what folks did on January 6th, but we also know that policing agencies helped them to do it, encouraged them to do it, enabled them to do it. We also know that we were lied to about the events of January 6th. And so in good conscience, we should call for a blanket amnesty of the January 6th prisoners. Not, not as an endorsement of what they did, not saying they're innocent, but just on the grounds that the capitalist state doesn't have the right to frame people up and entrap them. It's pretty basic. And I will tell you that the calling for that blanket amnesty leads me to remember what was really one of the most interesting nights of my life, which is when I was invited to speak at the hall where Malcolm X was assassinated in Harlem. There was a political prisoner's benefit. There were supporters of people from the Move 9 who were still locked up at that point. There were supporters of Mumia Abu-Jamal and Jamil Al-Amin. And I walked into this auditorium, and they had like a, a light where at the spot where Malcolm X had died. And, and I was on a panel, uh, and I was like the one white guy there. It was, people were joking about the flyer, and they're like, one of these speakers is a little bit different than all the other ones. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I was the only white guy there, and I, I looked out on that audience. I spoke for, like, three minutes. It was a very short presentation. But when I looked out on that crowd of several hundred people in there, I thought, I'm speaking to a, a, crowd, a group of veterans. 
I looked out on that crowd because these were black liberation fighters. These were black, black Panthers. These were black liberation army former members. These were, these were black nationalists and others and, and in walkers. And when, when people were speaking, they were shaking and having flashbacks and there were a lot of tears in their eyes. And, and I thought, this is, I'm speaking, this is like a veterans gathering. This is like speaking at the VFW, right? And I mean, there's rooms like this in Ireland, in Northern Ireland. There's rooms like this in South Africa. There's rooms like this in people's Korea, you know? And the, the, this is a group of people who have made great sacrifices, and they're, here, they're there to support their comrades who are still locked up. And they're in this for real, and they, they've, they've seen it. And I, I looked out on that crowd, and I thought, again, these are people who understand how serious it is, and this is how important all of this can be. And, you know, obviously our call for a blanket amnesty for January 6th is, is not limited to just them. We call for Leonard Peltier to be released. We call for Mumia Abu-Jamal to be released. We call for all political prisoners to be released, all black liberation fighters, blanket amnesty. If you want to heal a society, if you really want society to heal from the pain of, of the trauma of, of these kinds of things, where we know the FBI and COINTELPRO did all kinds of illegal things and none of them went to jail, you got to have a blanket amnesty. And it's just that simple. Same for J6, same for all the political prisoners in the United States. And also, I remember it was just recently uh, David Gilbert, who was one of the, the Weather Underground people, was released from jail. And I don't think people really realize the circumstances in which he was released, because it's very interesting. Uh, you know, our governor in New York is a guy named Andrew Cuomo. And Andrew Cuomo was forced to resign from office. There was a scandal, and one thing led to another, and many people say there was a bigger scandal that he didn't want to come out, so he was forced to resign. And the New York State Troopers Association was not supporting him. And so just before Andrew Cuomo was set to leave office, uh, he decided to issue a, a pardon, a commutation of sentence, for someone who was charged and had spent years behind bars for killing a state trooper. It was basically Andrew Cuomo saying, oh, you know, you guys, uh, you guys are not going to support me. This important association of state employees are going to call for me to resign. Well, I'm going to free David Gilbert. I'm going to free one of the weathermen. Th there you go, guys. That was basically what he was doing. Well, I mean, good, <laughs> you know, good. I, and, and there are divisions in the ruling class. Weird things happen, you know. And, you know, we don't endorse what David Dilbert did, but we recognize that, uh, you know, uh, you know, that there should be a blanket amnesty and that sometimes you have to utilize these divisions in the ruling class. And that's what gets me back to this, because it's pretty clear there are people in the ruling class that want this to continue. But more than that, I started out this talk by reading the quote from the, the legendary investor Jim Rogers. And there are people in the United States, in the capitalist class, that are tied in to this new emerging economy. And that creates an opening for us. And we would be fools if we did not figure out a way to fit ourselves into the crack to break this whole thing down. We would be fools if we didn't do that. We just stood on the sidelines and tried to be pure. Oh, we're so pure. We're so ultra-revolutionary. Look how pure we are. We would be fools. And there could be a moment where if we were to advocate this continuing or to continue advocating peace with Russia and China or to continue advocating economic development where we could have a real impact. It's really weird that 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 Trump pad podcast claimed I, I'm an influence on Tulsi Gabbard. That's really weird. We did not see that coming from anywhere. That was very bizarre. I think Liam is the first person to send that to me. We, and I saw that, and I'm like, where is this coming from? It was Trevor, Trevor Loudon, who's one of these anti-communist stalkers. And he was on the podcast of Roger Stone. And he says, yes, it was Caleb Mopin and the Center for Political Innovation. And they are a big influence on Tulsi Gabbard. And they represent Russia and North Korea. And I mean, it was, it was weird as hell. And I thought, where in the world did that come from? But you know what? If we're helping Tulsi Gabbard to push an anti-imperialist line, if she's listening right now, Tulsi, do not acknowledge me. Please, do not. If you, if you, do not even think about giving us credit. Do not even think about getting photographed with me. We don't want to hurt you in that way. But if you're listening and you're learning, if you're, if you're studying scientific Marxism, good for you. And I hope you keep doing it. And I hope that one day after President Tulsi Gabbard is elected president, uh, the CPI delegation is on Air Force One going to People's Korea to reestablish <laughs> diplomatic relations. CPI, 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 CPI. 
So I just want to end by saying that Che Guevara is often quoted as saying revolutionaries are motivated by great love. And uh, Country Joe and the fish here, they were also motivated by great feelings of love, much contrary to what their detractors have written. If you actually read about who these men were, if you actually read about what their strengths were, you'll know that these were men who were motivated by great feelings of love. They loved their people, they loved their communities, they loved the countries and the neighborhoods they came from, and they had a deep spiritual bond with their people. And if you want to be serious about changing politics in America, we must develop a similar deep spiritual bond with the American people. We've got to love the American people the same way these guys love their countries. We've got to have that deep connection with the people that they had. And that means we've got to not act like a bunch of crazy woke leftists. We've got to act rationally. And we've got to find a way to give voice to feelings that are already there and do the work that needs to be done. Because as Peter Coffin often says, this shouldn't be a commodified identity. It shouldn't be a brand. It shouldn't be a fan base. It should be a science for changing the world. And on that note, I think I've said everything I need to say for tonight. So thank you very much. Woo!